All right, so some more micro coming at you. Let's do a uh, summary of the toxins that are used by all these bacteria. Um, so phage encoded exotoxins, you can remember this by the mnemonic um, A, B, C, D, and E's. And that's uh, group A strep, A strep, botulism, cholera toxin, diphtheria toxin, uh, E. coli hemorrhagic or enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is a sugar like toxin. Um, and then you also have your sugar toxin. So that's how you can remember your phage encoded exotoxins. Now, Moving on to something of more, um, it's, it's super antigen exotoxins. Now, the mechanism by how these work is super antigens cross-link the alpha chain, the alpha chain of the MHC2 complex on the antigen-presenting cells with the variable region, with the variable region of the, um, of the beta chain, which is the beta, beta, beta variable region on T cell receptors on the CD4 TH T help T helper uh, T helper cells which leads to polyclonal T cell activation which leads to an increased IL2 production and an increased interferon gamma which activates macrophages so therefore you get a pro an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL1 IL6 tumor necrosis factor alpha etc now note Super antigens, super antigens do not, do not, do not, do not activate all CD4 T helper cells. Different super antigens are specific for different beta variable chains. Thus, they activate different subsets of CD4 T helper cells. Different subsets of CD4 T helper cells. Now, the two that I want you to be uh, really aware of is staph, uh, Staphylococcus aureus super antigen exotoxin, which causes toxic shock syndrome toxin, or TSST. Now, this is uh, toxic shock syndrome. Um, and also, in the food poison, you can get an enterotoxin. So those are the Staphylococcus aureus super antigen exotoxins. Now, with the streptococcus pyogenes super antigen exotoxins, you can have the SPEA and the SPEC, which leads to toxic shock-like syndrome, where you have a rash of, of scarlet fever, rash of scarlet fever, and then you can also have the SBE, which leads to necrotizing fasciitis. So it's the SBE or it's the SPEB that leads to necrotizing fasciitis, and it's the A and the C that lead to toxic shock like syndrome. Alrighty, moving right along. So let's talk about some exotoxins that use ADP ribosylation. So exotoxins that use ADP ribosylation is diphtheria, exotoxin, and exotoxin A of the Pseudomonas species. Diphtheria toxin and the exotoxin A of the Pseudomonas species. These ADP ribosylate and inactivates elongation factor 2. Inactivates elongation factor 2. And therefore, what's that going to do? That's going to inhibit protein synthesis. Now, the pertussis toxin, ADP ribosylates and inactivates GI, which, which is the guanylate cyclase um, or the GI coupled protein. So therefore, what's going to happen? Increased cyclic AMP, which is going to lead to increased secretions, which is going to lead to edema. Um, so you need to know that the pertussis toxin inactivates the GI coupled receptor. Now the cholera toxin or the um, heat labile toxin of enterotoxigenic E. coli or ETEC um, or the enterotoxin of Clostridium jejuni or um, C. jejuni, and that's only in some strains, those ADP ribosylate and therefore activate the GS coupled receptor, which does the same thing 
you had an increased cyclic uh, AMP, which leads to increased secretions, which leads to a watery diarrhea. So that's how ADP ribosylations work. So remember, pertussis inactivates GI, so you inactivate the inhibitor, which leads to increased cyclic AMP. Therefore, cholera toxin, ETEC, um, C. jejuni, only some strains of that. Um, what they do is they ADP ribosylate and they activate GS, which does the same thing causing the watery diarrhea. So, so let's talk about some exotoxins that function as proteases. Now, the first one is botulism toxin and tetanus toxin, are also known as tetano, tetanospasmin. Both cleave the releasing protein synaptobrevin synaptobrevin, thereby inhibiting neurotransmitter release. However, although they share a similar mechanism, these toxins affect the release of different neurotransmitters. Now, the tetanus toxin cleaves synaptobrevin, which inhibits the release of GABA and glycine. Now, GABA, both of these are inhibitory neurotransmitters, but GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Glycine is the main neuroinhibitory transmitter in the spinal cord, okay? Now, what does the botulism toxin do? It also cleaves synaptobrevin. It inhibits the release of acetylcholine, okay? Acetylcholine. Now, you have lethal factor of bacillus anthracis, which cleaves... Um, MAP kinases required for cellular division, thereby disrupting what? Therefore disrupting cellular division. You have uh, exfoliating of Staphylococcus aureus, which cleaves desmoglein, cleaves desmoglein of skin. Therefore, that leads to staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So it's the exfoliating of Staphylococcus aureus, which is the most common um, on our, on our skin. And then you have what we've already talked about, exotoxin B or SPEB of certain flesh-eating strains of streptococcus pyogenes that rapidly destroy tissue and may cause necrotizing... And that is the necrotizing fasciitis of streptococcus pyogenes. And it, and it is a medical emergency and it can be fatal within hours. Fatal within hours. Um... So let's talk about some exotoxins that increase cyclic AMP, which leads to increased secretions. Increased secretions. So the pertussis toxin, number one, this ADP ribosylates and therefore inactivates uh, GI-coupled proteins, therefore leading to increased cyclic AMP, therefore leading to increased secretions of sodium chloride and water from cells therefore leading to edema and neutrophil dysfunction. So we're going to have trouble fighting bacteria um, from a toxin. Note that the pertussis toxin also causes significant lymphocytosis. Significant lymphocytosis by inhibiting chemokine receptors. Inhibiting chemokine receptors. Therefore, lymphocytes can't enter lymphoid tissue. So therefore, what are they going to do? They're going to remain in the blood. So they can't go to the lymphoid tissue and mature. So that's how the pertussis toxin causes a lymphocytosis. A lot of people don't know that. Um, but they like to test you on that. So there you go. Um, now, the edema factor of bacillus anthracis. Edema factor has uh, intrinsic adenylate cyclase activity. So you're going to get an increased cyclic AMP, which does the same thing. Increased secretions of sodium chloride water from cells. So you're going to get uh, edema and neutrophil dysfunction again. Now the cholera toxin or the heat labile toxin of, of enterotoxigenic E. coli or ETEC, um, diarrheogenic enterotoxins of bacillus cereus, enterotoxins of C. jejuni, and remember, only some strains, these all ADP ribosylate and thereby and therefore activate GS. GS, which does the same thing. So if you inactivate GI or you activate GS, 
you're going to get an increase in cyclic AMP, which leads to increased secretions. Um, sodium chloride water follows from the intestinal mucosa. You get a watery diarrhea. Notice now, when you activate GS, you get a watery diarrhea. But when you um, when you get when you stimulate the or inactivate the inhibitor. You don't really get a watery diarrhea. You get more neutrophil dysfunction, lymphocytosis, things like that, things of that nature. Now, exotoxins which increase cyclic GMP, parasympathetic. That would be the ST of ETEC, which is the heat-stable uh, toxin of enterotoxigenic E. coli, and the enterotoxin of Yersinia enterocolitica. Those are the two that increase cyclic uh, GMP. So, exotoxins which inhibit protein synthesis. This is your diphtheria toxin, your exotoxin A of the Pseudomonas species. These ADP ribosylate and therefore inactivate elongation factor 2, inhibiting ultimately protein synthesis. Now, you also got the virotoxin, which is a sugar-like toxin of enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or EHEC. Now, the sugar toxin of the Shigella species degrades the 28S RNA, RRNA, and it prevents the binding of the tRNA to the 60S ribosomal subunit. And therefore, what's it do? It inhibits protein synthesis. So that's all you got to remember. All we're doing here is inhibiting protein synthesis, and that's how these things are thriving. Um, so exotoxins, which form pores and cell membranes. We have a couple here. Clostridium perfringens uh, enterotoxin. It binds to clodulins. It binds to clodulins, which are proteins involved in maintaining intracellular junctions on cell surfaces. And therefore, that leads to the formation of pores in the cell membrane, which leads to osmotic swelling and lysis because remember sodium's gradient always wants to rush in so when you have when you have potassium that's leaking out because your potassium ATPase is shut down and sodium is rushing in therefore chloride is going to follow water is going to follow the cells are going to swell it's going to lyse you're going to have cellular death now there are two types of bacillus serous enterotoxins causing food poisoning especially due to ingestion of reheated rice reheated rice Food poisoning. Um, so number one, one to 1.5 hours, or one to five hours actually, one to five hours after ingestion, you get an emetic food poisoning. You get an emetic food poisoning, which is basically nausea and vomiting, um, due to the heat stable emetic enterotoxin or ETE. Heat stable emetic enterotoxin, which is elaborated by Bacillus cereus. Now, ETE forms pores in cell membranes, which leads to osmotic swelling and lysis, and therefore, guess what? Cellular death. Now, that's within one to five hours. If it's been 15 to 20 hours, 15 to 20 hours, this leads, uh, after ingestion, this leads to diarrheal food poisoning. Diarrheal food poisoning due to heat labile di hemorrhagic enterotoxins elaborated by Bacillus cereus. Now, these diarrheogenic enterotoxins induce cyclic AMP to increase secretions. And that's been a theme with all these toxins. If you don't know, just pick cyclic AMP is going to be up somehow. Um, it's similar to the mechanism of LT of ETEC, and it may also form pores in the cell membrane similar to ETE of Bacillus uh, cereus.
So we have two more to talk about, and that is two exotoxins of Clostridium difficile. Now we have exot exotoxin A, which is an enterotoxin of Clostridium difficile. These are chemoattractants. Chemoattractants, uh, a chemo attracts neutrophils, which release cytokines. which release cytokines, which leads to mucosal inflammation. Mucosal inflammation and GI fluid loss. Now we also have the exotoxin B, which is a cytotoxin of Clostridium difficile. This disrupts the cytoskeleton by depolymerizing actin filaments. <laughs> yeah. What happens is this leads to GI mucosal cell death, which leads to pseudomembranous colitis. And that is your toxins for microbiology.